Somebody turn to the neighbor and say, this is going to be the best Christmas ever. Now turn to the other neighbor and say, good, what are you going to get me? All right. We're going to play a little game this morning. I got three quotes, and, and before you just shout out the answer, um, I want you to listen to the three quotes and then, and then give your answer. First quote, someone famous, says this. He said, I, I, I guess I could use a little social interaction. Okay? Second quote from the same person. Am I just eating because I'm bored? And then the third one is about the calendar, his schedule. And he's looking at his calendar and his schedule. He says, well, 4 o'clock, wallow in self-pity. 4.30, stare into the abyss. 5 o'clock, solve world hunger and tell no one. 5.30, jazzercise. 6.30, dinner with me. I can't cancel that again. 7 o'clock, wrestle with my self-loathing. I'm booked. Of course, if I bump the loathing to nine, I could still be done in time to lay in bed, stare at the ceiling, and slip slowly into madness. That's it. Y'all yell it out. The Grinch. Can we put a picture up there? Oh, yeah. You guessed it. It is the Grinch. All right. If you're taking notes today, uh, I would write this down. Perfect love is not seasonal, it's eternal. Perfect love is not seasonal, it's eternal. And so I love this season. Who here, Christmas, your favorite season? Come on. If not, we'll go back to that picture and we'll just pretend it's the mirror, okay? Christmas is amazing because it's a time where everybody agrees that we can be generous to one another. All right, but this is God's heart from the beginning, amen? He, out of him flows grace upon grace, his generosity. 1 John 4, 17 says this, love is perfected with us. It's perfected with you and I. It's perfected inside of you. How is that possible? Because Christ is in you. Why is this possible? Because you can have confidence for the day of judgment because as he is, so also are we in this world. I would speak to my kids this way, that as Jesus is, so are my kids in this world. When they were five, seven, and nine, we would come home and something would be broken. Come on, parents, you know what I'm talking about? I mean, you know that where your mom starts breaking down, I can't have nice things, right? You know what I'm talking about? And no one did it. We, we didn't blame the dog, but we actually came up with someone named Bob. Bob did it. We just figured out that Bob lived in the house. We'd never met him before. In fact, when they became teenagers, anybody know what, a, what one of those uh, vacuum cleaners that are, you know, just kind of go on the floor, the electronic vacuums? We, the robot? Okay, we called it Bob. We just needed someone to blame, so we called it Bob. All right? So if you have a robot vacuum, I... Just suggest that you name it and blame it on it. Now, here's the thing. At no time that my kids wouldn't fess up to the things that they were doing, did I ever think I'm going to remove their name, the name Pollard. And we're going to talk a little bit about this because Jesus wants you to have confidence in him that's in you, that he is in you, so that when you stand before the Father one day, you know his attitude towards you. You know his thoughts towards you, okay? And then as parents, we're going to teach our children that even when they won't even fess up to the things that they've done, that they're still part of the family and that God loves them, all right? Do I believe that they should fess up? Absolutely. Now, we're, we're working on character. For those of the, you that, that don't know, I had some character issues growing up. My parents, uh, my mom worked two jobs and went to school full time, so my house was empty. My dad left the house when I was 13. How I many you know it's not wisdom to leave a 13-year-old boy in a home by himself seven days a week? Not wisdom, all right? And I struggled with character. And I'd given my life to Jesus, but I kept hearing these sermons about, you know, if you were really serving Jesus, then you would have this type of character, and you may not be saved. So you may need to get saved. 
And so you know what I did is I got saved, and I got saved, and I got saved. And really, I needed a father in my house to tell me, boy, it worked the first time. And you are the man that God has made you to be. So if you're in this house today, you're going to hear what the Father's saying to you. Amen? I had a friend who had three boys, young man, a friend of mine. He had three boys back to back to back. And then they had this decision. I know it was God, but they had this decision to adopt five more. Everybody raise the hand. Five. Five more. That's the number of grace. I'm just telling you right there. Five more. They adopted five more. And I was uh, doing a teaching on adoption. And so I brought him into my office and I just, I sat him down. I said, hey, I don't know anything about adoption the way that you know about adoption. I said, so tell me, what's the number one fear from children that have just been recently adopted? And he said, Brandon, the number one fear that we have to work with, mom and dad have to work with, is that they'll be returned. I mean, I, I broke down in the office. I was crying. Are you kidding me? He said, yeah, they'll, do, they'll try to just self-sabotage the relationship so that they can prove that they're not worthy so that they will be returned. They'll just try to hit the, de de the detonation switch and try to blow themselves up. Not literally, but you know what I'm talking about relationship-wise. So that they can say, see, you didn't love me anyways. And it broke my heart. And I want to show you some scripture today that people are using to say that Jesus is returning his children. And I believe it's demonic. We're going to turn to Matthew 7, 21. Matthew 7, 21. Sometimes you'll hear teachers talk about this. Well, this is the scripture where Jesus says, I never knew you. So, so, so you know, those, those Christians that are just doing the bad things and doing the wrong things. Well, well Jesus is just going to, he's going to say, I never knew you. I'm returning you. Anybody ever got a bad gift that you returned for Christmas? Come on, y'all raise your hands. If the person gave it to you, don't look them in the eyes. Don't look them in the eyes. Don't look at it. But come on, all of us have done it. We had to return a gift that we just didn't like. All right? You are not that gift. Listen to me. You're a gift to the Father, from the Father to the Son. You're a gift, and He's not returning you. You're not a bad gift. He loves you. And I want to show you this scripture, not to confuse you, but to bring to light. One of my favorite pastors says this, if a scripture is taken out of context, you're left with a con. And this scripture has been taken out of context so much in order that people will go to the altar to get resaved and resaved and resaved. And a lot of times, 70% of the church will come down to the altar to get saved. And I believe that it breaks the father's heart. And the reason why is because if my children came to me and said, I want to be a Pollard again, I'm a bad parent. Okay, y'all following along? Matthew 7. Matthew 7, 21. Is it up on the screen? Hallelujah. Are we there yet? There it is. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in. I'm going to go to my scripture. Who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Cast out demons in your name. And do many mighty works in your name. And then I will declare to them, this is the famous part, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Now, what, what we hear from teachers is that these people just were, were not making God happy. They weren't, you know, making him Lord of every area of their life. Okay? I, I, anybody heard these sermons? We've heard them. Okay, if you've been walking a long time with the Lord and been listening to different teachings, you've heard them. But I want you to understand something, that when Jesus said, I never knew you, that to me tells me in context that they were never saved. This isn't a returning of a gift. Okay? And it's not about works. If it was about works, they're doing some great works. Look at it. Their character is amazing. They're, they're casting out demons, prophesying in his name. I mean, this is the perfect son and child, right? Doing all the things that a parent wants them to do. But they're missing something. And we're going to look at what they're missing by Scripture interpreting 
scripture. If you remove scripture, just take one scripture out, you can make it into all sorts of weird theology. But you need a scripture to interpret scripture, okay? And so let's look at what Jesus says in John 6, 39 through 40. He said, this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father. Let's stop right there. Matthew 7, 21 says, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. He said, who will enter the kingdom of heaven? The one who does the will of my Father. So let's go back to verse 39, or verse 40, excuse me. This is the will of my Father that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have Everyone that looks on the Son and believes in Him should have? You know what? I love John because John is the person that's just leaning back on Jesus. He's the one that receives the most love from the disciples. Like he is a receiver to the max. We, we talk about what's our vision at this church, and we talk about receive, give, and serve in grace. But you have to be an amazing receiver from Jesus. Because freely you've received, so freely give. And a lot of people skip over and just say, well, you need to give, you need to give. You need. Have you taken the time to freely receive? And John is the one writing this. And he's empowered by the Holy Spirit because the Bible says that all scriptures God breathed. So the Holy Spirit's breathing on this scripture. And he's telling us that the will of the Father is to believe in Jesus to have eternal life. Also, John was the one that said eternal life is knowing. In John, Jesus said it. Eternal life is knowing the Father and the Son. So I tell you this because some people think, well, one day when I get to heaven, I'll experience eternal life. You can experience it now. Knowing Jesus. Knowing him. I did a, I, I was in this mode of reading and I read a, a biography, and I read a bunch of different books, but if you read a biography on someone, it doesn't mean you know them. You read biographies on all sorts of presidents. doesn't mean you know them. And the Pharisees at the time, they, they read the biography, and yet the word of God is in the flesh, and they don't know him. And so knowing him is important in eternal life. Now, I'm saying all this so that we can trust in his righteousness, not our own. And this is what Christianity is about, is trusting in his righteousness, his character, and not our own. And this is good parenting, by the way. Good parenting points to Christ's righteousness, Christ's character. And then we give them some time mamas, to grow in their character. Daddies, we give them time to grow in their character. If we want to stunt their growth in character, then we point to our own righteousness because they'll be disappointed in 50 years that you were developing your character and their character's not caught up. You make sense? So we want to point to Christ's character when we're parenting or not all of us are parents in this room. We're all called to disciple. You follow along? So don't zoom out if you're not parents because you're called to disciple. And discipleship is about pointing to Jesus. Now, there's three common mistakes, and we're almost done, for people that are trusting in their own righteousness. Three common mistakes. Number one, they boast in their own obedience instead of receiving Christ's love. Y'all remember Peter? Oh, Jesus, I'll never leave you. I'm going to be right beside you. You got a friend in me. You got a friend. You know, and, and Jesus is like, hey, listen, before the, even the rooster crows, buddy, you're out of here. A little girl is going to intimidate you, and you're going to deny me. Why? 
because he was boasting in his own love. And then you see John leaning back and, and just leaning back into Jesus and singing about how much Jesus loves him. And so when Jesus is, is, is in his darkest moment and he's hanging on the cross, he then turns his family, his mother, who is the most precious to him, the most precious gift is, is his mom. Guess who's there? It's not Peter. Peter's too busy crying about what he's done and his character's low. Where John's so busy just knowing that he's loved that he actually has standing at the cross and ready to receive the greatest gift, which is taking care of Jesus' mother. Knowing that you're loved by Jesus is the most important thing that we can do on the earth. It's receiving his love. Amen? Then the second common mistake is, is people that trust in their own righteousness, they struggle to disciple the next generation. This is a real struggle for them. They can't figure it out. It's like that get off my yard guy, right? Y'all remember Up? You know? That guy, that guy did not want, some of y'all don't, haven't seen this movie, but basically the guy's 70, maybe 80, and he's, he, he doesn't want this Boy Scout on his yard. And it's a great movie. By the end, they're best friends, okay? Great movie. I'm no spoilers. I'm sorry. But those who are trusting in their own righteousness, they struggle to disciple the next generation because they point to the law and themselves. This is how I did it. This is how you should do it. If you could be like me, it's the whole Peter syndrome. Instead of going, man, there, there are times where I've blown it, but look at Jesus, son. Daughter, don't look at me. Look at Jesus. Child, don't look at me. Look at Jesus. Everything I have is because of him. Look to Christ. Amen? And then the third common mistake for people trusting in their own righteousness, they will walk away from loving others and they'll call it forgiveness. They will walk away from relationships and they will call it forgiveness. How many of you know, raise your hand if you say Jesus will never leave you or forsake you. Raise your hand. If you're a believer in this room, you haven't heard that message from us, Go back to our YouTube videos because we got them. Jesus will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And the law, he said, the new command that I give you is for you to love one another as Christ has loved you. Well, you just told me Jesus will never leave you. He will never forsake you. So when can we leave other people and forsake them? Brandon, I'm going to email you and give you a whole list of bad things that people have done to me. You're welcome to do that, but I'm going to email you all the bad things I've done to Jesus. And he's still stuck with me. You say, Brandon, you don't understand. I've denied him. Yeah, I've done that too. See, in the, in the times where I was so faithless, he was faithful. When I, when I couldn't even muster up to sing to him or to worship him, he would sing songs over me. See, there's some mothers in this place that understand that when a baby is born, it can't do anything for you. Nothing can add to your misery, but it can't do nothing back for you keep you up late at night and sometimes they'll have gas and make cute faces I mean I think that was God giving us a little bit of the reward but we all lived in that season with Jesus where we just could not do anything back for him and while we were still sinners he still loved us so mess you up if you want to hang on to bitterness this ain't this ain't the thing for you, which is Christ. 
Because in Christ, we have to forgive. We can't hang on to, well, this church hurt me. Well, great. Anytime you're around relationships or jobs, whoever has been hurt at a job? I have. You know why? Because there was people there. So we can go back to the Grinch and say, I, I, I want to isolate myself. Come on, who said that? I've said that. I've said it. And the Lord doesn't isolate himself from me.